G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. And today's special guests are authors of Our Spirit and Australian Defence Force veterans, Jennifer Crane and Melanie Bird, CSC. They share a passion for recording the stories of female veterans. They have collected the stories and created works of women who have served in the ADF since 1960. The author's goal was to capture female veterans' unique spirit through the different forms in which they choose to express their service. They share their insights not only about the book but also the service of female veterans. Hi Mel, hi Jennifer, thanks for joining us on the show. Hi Adam, it's great to be here. Oh, thanks Adam. Thank you both. It's, it's fantastic to have you both on to talk about a, a really important subject. So Jennifer and Mel, your, your service in the Australian Defence Force represents different service and different eras. Jennifer, you enlisted in 1979 in the Women's Royal Australian Army Corps Officer Cadets course in Sydney. And Mel, you were in the Air Force Cadets before attending the Australian Defence Force Academy in 1990. What do you consider to be the most significant similarities and differences between your enlistment experiences? And how do you think social and ADF attitudes to women in the military had changed between the late 1970s and the early 1990s? I'll I'll start because um, I came in first. In 1979, when I enlisted, it was the first 12-month um, female officer course, and it was based on the on the male um, officer course at Portsea, and um, it was it was very much experimental. They were just trying to bring in what they thought that women could do. So um, they were bringing in more weapons training, more field training, and and that type of thing. So previously, the courses were for females were only three to four months, I think, and. Um, yeah, so having the the first twelve months, it was it was pretty much a bit of an experiment, and I think uh, for quite a few years after that, they still really didn't know what to do with us. So, and um, yeah, and a lot of the aspects of it were were slowly changing. They were trying to find out what could work, how to handle females doing doing some of those um, things that the the males were doing. So. Uh, that was the the start of a lot of changes, I think. So for you, sorry, Mel. I'll, no, no, I'll keep going. No, it's good. So for you, <laughs> Jennifer, what was what was basic training like? What what did you experience? Was it the same as what men went through, or was it totally different? It it was had some similarities. It wasn't as intense as uh, as what the the guys did. So. Um, we did go out field, but not to the extent that the the males were um, practicing it. Um, uh, a lot of it was uh, was office work, field work, um, and that and that type of thing. But um, certainly not as infantry based. I suppose you could you could look at it um, as the as the males were doing it. Yeah. So for you, Mel, what was the difference from the late 1970s to the 1990s when you enlisted in the Air Force? Yeah. Um, well, so I went to ADFA, so, and that was tri-service, and it was male and females all in together, living um, in the, the divisions and the buildings together. So there wasn't, I suppose, that segregation of, you know, women... Um, just they they done their <laughs> trials with you know the the ladies from Jennifer's era and it, it was more incorporated I suppose by the time um, I joined and, and went to Adfa um, and it was interesting being there because well we were all wore our individual uniforms and we would do common military training and we'd also go and do single service and single service training as well and I have to admit. I used to love doing Air Force single service training much more than um, I did enjoyed the common military training. But it was just nice because, you know, you join your service to go and, and um, do the things that your service does. So I really, in, I used to really enjoy going off to Air Force bases and being around aircraft and aviation. Um, and uh, we'd always come back, you know, together as class uh, classmates and compare our experiences. And um, the army were usually off digging trenches and 
and um, out the back of Singleton and a few other things. And the Navy would do what they would call training crews, where they would, um, you know, take a lot of the midshipmen and go and do be on a ship for a couple of weeks, especially um, at the beginning of the year, and um, and learn how sh- you know the cycles of ships works and, and things like that. So I suppose that you know one of, that was one of the biggest differences by that stage. Um, and one of the interesting things my year at ADFA was that it was originally ADFA for Air Force in particular, particular was set up that you would be a supply officer, an engineer or air crew. Um, but my year was the first year where they had other categories. So um, we had administrative officers, we had intelligence officers and so they had really opened up all of those categories by that stage at ADFA. So that was one of those other changes that they were going through then is opening up that sort of ter- that you know that um, university qualification through that establishment yeah so what motivated you both to join what was what was it that the defense forces gave you that you both wanted to enlist and serve your country I was in teachers college and realized I really didn't want to be a teacher and um, you know back in the in the 70s you know our our um, we were fairly limited on what we could do with some sort of um, an admin role, you know, go to the bank, be a teacher, something like that. And um, I grew up on a, on a country property and I wanted to be doing something a little bit more exciting. And um, it was a way of um, having a job, getting paid. Um, they provide somewhere for you to uh, eat and sleep and earn a career and then they, you know, would then find their job for you somewhere in Australia so it sort of opened up those doors a little bit more to just doing what was um, traditionally available to uh, to a lot of women in the 70s yeah. Why for you Jennifer did you choose the army and not the air force or the navy? Uh, Navy didn't appeal to me I wasn't really uh, into boats and um, I didn't think that there was anything available through the air force I think it was mainly at that stage um, I, I like through the nursing field, uh, which I wasn't interested in. So uh, Amy just uh, the army just sort of gave a, a little bit more um, opportunity, probably as a supply transport administrative type of roles. Yeah, yeah. And for you, Mel, what was what was your uh, reasons for joining the RAF? Oh, there were so uh, quite a few. Um, there were uh, wanting you know to go and do something different, but a sense of adventure and wanting to travel Um, because I grew up in in Tasmania, so I wanted to go out and and see the world. Um, I also wanted a career. um, uh, And at that stage, I did know that I wanted to um, get a a degree of some sort. And um, I was one of four children, and um, I wasn't sure whether mum or dad would be able to afford me and my younger brother, um, the one after me, who's just 13 months younger, if they'd be able to afford to... um, to send us both to university. And at, at that stage, so this is through high school, I, I, um, I actually wanted to be a pilot. So that, you know, and to go to the Air Force was obviously, um, you know, um, having seen the roulettes at quite a few um, shows and things and then, you know, Top Gun came out. <laughs> as tragic, as tragic as this sounds. You know, Top Gun came out and um, uh, and the second is coming out very soon too. I just So that is, looks pretty exciting. Um, yeah, and so all of those things sort of combined and, and uh, my dad sat me down when I was in year seven and said, look, you know, you're going to have to start thinking about your subject choices, what you want to do and, um, and uh, joining the Air Force was one of those things that I, that I wanted to do. So he then took me off to join Air Cadets um, which I really, really loved, and um, and then yeah, di- failed. At just have no aptitude for being a pilot whatsoever. But decided I still wanted to join the Air Force and go through ADFA. And I, I did. I knew very early on that I didn't want to be an engineer. So supply at that stage was the only other thing that was offered. So that's how I, yeah, came to be in the Air Force and chose supply. So did both of you have relatives that served in the military before you both decided to enlist in the Defence Force itself or or are you guys the first in your families to serve in the Defence Forces? Yeah, I don't have any any close relatives. I think I had an uncle who was in the war 
a couple of uncles who were in the war, but um, no one close, no. There was no influence there. For yourself, Mel? Yeah, my granddad was in the Air Force during the Second World War um, and he didn't talk much. He, he lived with us towards the latter part of his life and he didn't talk a lot about it. And we were only young, so we probably didn't even know to ask about it, other than we did know that he had been in the Air Force. Um, and, and one of the funny stories that we always got told is, um, so he was an aircraft mechanic and he was up in, in Darwin and um, he dropped an en- aircraft engine on his feet and as a result he had eight toes. And so that was one of the funniest things that I remember about his service, you know, um, growing up because Grandad only had eight toes. But, um, yeah, but I, think, I think it did have a little bit of an influence, um, you know, probably more at a subconscious level than a really conscious level um yeah and I think you know having he was the only grandparent I had as well growing up the only one that I knew and so and um I loved him a great deal and so there was probably that connection as well you know for his service and then to go and and join the air force as well yeah so f- for both of you, what were the reactions of your family and friends when you both said that you were enlisting in the Defence Forces? I think mum and dad were a bit stunned. It was a case of didn't see that coming. Uh, but they were, they were really supportive because they could see that um, you know, going to teachers' college really wasn't my thing. And as I said, very limited or what else you could do. And it was a case of, um, well, try it and see how far you get. And of course, you... As you progress through each um, step of the enlistment process, you just think, well, I've done that one, I might as well try the next one. And, uh, yeah, the next minute you're accepted and you sort of think, oh, well, I'm here now. Off we go. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Mel? Um, well, my dad obviously was very much, you know, su- very supportive. Um, my mum probably uh, initially was not, uh, she probably got upset at the thought of me leaving home and not just leaving home but leaving the state. Um, but eventually she got used to it and I think they, um, yeah, I think they, they thought it was a, a, a good idea. Um, yeah, they we're very um, family focused so I think they still at times struggle <laughs> and I know I struggle as I get older that I'm far, you know, far away from them because they still live in Tasmania but I think overall they, were, they saw it as a, as a good thing, yeah. So, Jennifer, for you, you were allocated to the Royal Australian Army Ordnance Corps and served in logistics, training and administration. What event or aspects of your service are you most proud of and why? And when compiling the book, what aspects of some of the other women's service resonated with you the most? I don't think that there was... I don't think that I uh, did anything... um, of note, we, it was very much the um, the post Vietnam era, and uh, there were no deployments overseas, so we were very much in country based, and so it was just a case of getting on and and doing your job. So there wasn't um, anything that I really can can highlight as as standing out in my career. It was just doing your job as best you can wherever you happen to be, and uh, talking to the women or or reading their their stories um, as they sort of progressed um, through the decades. The, um, I I think, them being able to relate their experiences and and they're all very much, very much different. Um, But there's always um, a a, a shared experience um, for all of us, irrespective of, of what um, you know, spectacular um, parts of their service they, uh, they may talk about. So, um, and I love seeing what the women have been able to achieve and some of the amazing things that they have done. And I constantly think, oh, I don't know if I would have been able to do that. So um, it, it amazes me and um, I'm incredibly proud of, of what these, uh, these ladies have been able to do. Yeah. So would you both agree that the women of your era, Jennifer, and, and the women that went before you were real trailblazers for the women in the, in the Defence Forces today? I don't know about trailblazers, but I think, I think the women were really trying to, uh, to fight to be recognised for, for 
um, what they can do. I don't think capability was ever a question because if you read some of the fem stories of, of women, whether they were um, nurses or administrators or code breakers, they've done amazing things throughout all of uh, all of our conflicts. So capability was always there. I think a lot of it was um, social acceptance, whether society wanted was able to accept women being in those roles um, outside of um, severe conflict times. And um, it, was, it was slowly pushing through some of those, those barriers. And um, you know, things like, I was just talking to a, a lady the other day who served during the 50s and she had to get out when she was, was married. She was in, the, in the, um, uh, the old version of the RAF. And uh, she loved her service, but um, society dictated that you know a, a married woman couldn't couldn't serve. So even though she loved her job, um, she had to had to take discharge because she wanted to get married. So there was a conflict between um, uh, what was socially acceptable and and um, what was needed in the service. And uh, it, it's just been a very slow slow progress. And you can see through the book. Uh, when we did the timeline, that it's an exponential curve of um, how women, you know, sort of broke through those those barriers and were able to fulfil those roles very successfully um, up, up until today, and they're, they're still breaking some of those barriers, and and a lot of firsts are still coming through. So, um, yeah, yeah. Your service achievements include being the first female aide de camp to the chief of the air staff. Can you share with us what that role was was and what it involved? Um, yeah, so the aide de camp um, or the ADC uh, basically coordinates and keeps the chief on time and on schedule and they coordinate their diary um, and all the functions and the work that goes through their office. So they're more visible when they when the chiefs and um, go out to the bases because they the ones that usually are calling time on the bosses and getting them to, to be where they need to be at the right time, but also running, um, you know, making sure that, you know, they're, they're not being overwhelmed with certain things or keeping, you know, um, I remember I was out one time and uh, I was at a formal function with the boss and it was the night of um, the Black Hawk helicopter incident. So I was you know, called to go and get him and to, um, and you know, be, make sure that he was, he then was in the phone calls and being briefed on, on the things that were, as they were unfolding. So that was very much part of my job. But it, it's interesting. So I was the first female because at that stage, the Air Force had only just opened up air crew to women. And at the same time, aide de comps had only been air crew. And so, because most of the the um, air crew were men at that stage, you know, I think there were only two or three female pilots, um, and they used to the aide used to fly the chief of air staff's PC nine that was located out at Fairburn. And so, a couple of things happened. So, um, the uh, chief decided that he didn't need his own plane; that he would put that aircraft back into the fleet of training aircraft, which opened up it meant that that role no longer had to be a pilot role, so it opened it up for other categories to, to go and do it. So, yes, it was just a happy coincidence that I got to um, to do that job. And it was... I really enjoyed it. I saw the Air Force from a very, very different perspective as a junior officer um, as a result of that role, and uh, I think that helped me a great deal to understand the, that sort of semi-political nature of the service chief's job, um, and, you know, that it's not exposure that a lot of people get, I suppose. Yeah, it was good. So you were involved with the operational planning of the Operation Bastille with the US Central Command Central Air Force. What were the ob objectives of Operation Bastille and what were your imp impressions of working with the American military? Um, oh, I actually loved working with the Americans. So I flew over to Tampa to Cent CENTCOM, so Central Command, um, and was part of the planning team over there and also part of my liaison job that I was doing, noting that um, at that stage we had um, a number of forces, Air Force, Air Force sort of force elements that we were thinking about sending. 
um, that I would then go up to uh, Sumter in South Carolina and be um, and also go up and liaise with the with the Australian Air Force people that were up there in um, in in, Cent in Centaf. Um, so and I really love working with the Americans. They were always very receptive um, to. Uh, questions and and anything that I needed um, and would really help facilitate um, the requirements that I was trying to get from the force elements that we were sending over or looking at sending over and also trying to work out some of that detail, basing detail, what that looked like, how we would fit into the command and control structure. Um, and I would, you know, I spend a lot of time going backwards and forwards, so I was trying to do it for the um, and then feed those Air Force requirements into um, the Australian planners as well that were at um, down in Tampa, um, and that that was a really interesting that was a really interesting time, and I really um, appreciate that, like loved the opportunity to go and do that, and then deploy forward into the what was known as the Middle Eastern Area of Operations as part of the national headquarters. So the planning team became the core staff of that national headquarters over in the Middle East. And we were initially based in, um, in Qatar and, uh, and then moved forward into Iraq at the latter stage of, of my deployment over there. How long was your deployment over in Iraq? Uh, nine months. Oh, well, so the first part was in the US yep. and then from just before Christmas right through to about mid-year, it, it was over there in the, in the Middle East. So in 2004, you were awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross for Excellence in Logistics, Planning and Support to Operations. Can you tell us about this award? As for the public, it's probably not as well known as some of the other military awards. No, it's a, actually it's a peacetime award um, because a lot of the work that I had done and that I was doing in preparation was before um, the actual deployment date. So it's a it, it is a it's a it's an award you get for um, for I suppose conspicuous service during um, not in deployed operations, even though all the work that I did um, to be awarded the CSC was done. Um, in support of and to get to deployed operations. Um, and I was really surprised when I got um, notification of, of getting that award. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, a pleasant surprise. And the best part was that my family came up. Um, I was presented that award in Sydney um, and Marie Bashir was the governor at the time and she presented, it was a special award ceremony just for um, all of the service piece, people who had received um, honours and awards during that particular conflict, and so it was it was just us and all of all of us who had been deployed over there. So it was a special military ceremony, and my parents came up, and uh, and my brother who lived in Sydney at the time was also there. So it was just a really lovely thing for them to to come and see. And you know, it, it was um, I remember on the day. Because everyone is very stoic, and I'm not a very, you know, I'm a, um, I don't, I'm not a poker player for a very good reason, and so, I, and I was just so chuffed to be there. I couldn't stop smiling, and I think I was the only person who's, you know, they're standing there reading out the uh, the award and the nomination, and I was just standing at attention, like, just, just overwhelmed with like, pride, I suppose, and um, and the. Um, air commander who I then went to work for in my next job said he said oh my god you, you, you were just bursting you were just bursting and I and I felt like a failure because everybody else was just so rigid and they just had on their you know their game faces on and they you know had their serious faces and um and I was just I just kept saying thank you to everybody <laughs> But it was a really lovely day, and the fact that my family could be there was was fantastic. But yeah, so uh, CSCs aren't well known, but um, they're yeah, and they're only military awards, so they're not like you know orders of Australia, which go across. You have a military division, and then you have other divisions within those awards. The conspicuous service awards are are only military awards. Since leaving the ADF, both of you have an interest in writing. Can you share with us how you met and how the idea of writing Our Spirit came about and what did you want to be different 
about this book? What, what was it for you both that you wanted it to stand out? <laughs> it, it was something... Um, so at the time, I was working in the um, Queensland government's um, commemorative program for the First World War. And I just, in learning about that history and, and um, you know, being interested in that era and then going into bookshops and trying to learn more about, you know, women's service during that time or women's stories during that time, I was, you know, I worked in the city so I would go into, there was quite a few big bookshop stores in there at the time and um, go into the military history or the military stories and of the, you know, three or four shelves worth of books, you would find one or two. And I thought, this is not, this is not, I understand from a historical perspective that that, that, that makes sense. But I said, you know, there's, I thought there's people like me who, who might not have a whole book in them, but might want to actually tell a story. Or, and so I started to just think about that quite a lot. And I was quite scared to do that by myself and I thought I, I need someone to be accountable to and I need a partner who is going to help me and stop me from being scared. And then this, and then a, a notice came up on, um, I think it was on Facebook, about a, a, a defence women's writing workshop and I went, I took the day off and I went, right, I'm going to, to this and I met Jennifer there and I just, at the end of it, I said, look, I've just got this idea, you know, would you like to partner with me to to take this to the next step? And then, you know, we've got some methods and ways that we could probably get funding through grants. But what do you think? Do you think it, it's... Would you, would you be my partner? And, um, and she said, well, I'd like maybe it to be more artistic and a bit more, you know, focused on sort of more creative works um, as opposed to historical. And I was just so happy that she thought... Um, that that was a good idea, and so we started working together from that point. Is that a fairly, yes. fairly good? Re- <laughs> yeah. So for you both, once the project got off the ground, how hard was it to find female veterans to tell their stories? Yeah, well, we used um, social media, but and we thought we would be absolutely flooded with stories. Um, but I think a lot of lot of women will, will tell their stories in private. And for any, any creative um, mode, I, th- I think putting yourself out there is, is difficult. So these, these ladies that um, are in the book, they're incredibly brave to put their stories forward and not just to friends and family but to complete strangers as well. And, um, and their reaction was, oh, we're, we're just so pleased that someone is telling our stories uh, in, in whatever... Um, fashion, whether it be um, through art, is, it might be how they um, express how they felt about their service, um, poetry, or, or just their from their um, memoirs. So um, yeah, probably not as many as we thought we would certainly get, but we certainly had a, a, a beautiful range of, of stories telling different aspects of of their service. And what we wanted it was the women to um, express to us what has stayed with them as part of their service, whether it was their, their most important um, part or their did joining, their leaving or, or um, you know, some aspect that uh, has really stayed with them. And I think we managed to, to capture that, yeah. How long was the process from start to finish for the book? How many, how many years did it take you to put it into fruition? Four, was it? We did have, of course, life gets in the way when you start these projects. And um, I think we, it was about 18 months period there that, uh, yeah, life got in the way and other things were happening, this, that and the other. So uh, we started with a, a real flurry and um, then it sort of waned a little bit, but always working on it slowly, slowly, just doing small bits. And um, then when things were um, able to start working again, we just um, picked it up and, and ran with it, yeah. So in those periods of where it was a long process, what, what were the driving factors for you both to continue this project? What, what was it for you both that made you want to continue to get this book out? I think when we started to get submissions and, um, you know, 
that was really, you know, then we had, it was then became bigger than us, I suppose. And we had an obligation because we had promised that we were going to do this. And I think, you know, even though it did take a long time and we would get every now and then a couple of emails saying, what's taking so long? Um, it was ultimately that commitment to tell the stories and to know that it that what we were doing was something that was a bit different um, and and that we really, you know, for us it was a passion project and something that we really believed needed to be done. Um, and to tell those stories in, in different formats of um, women's service. And I think artwork is... Um, and you know other forms other than long form, um, you know, narr um, non-fiction narrative, is can be a bit underestimated. So I think you know even getting snippets of things and and looking at some of the artwork or reading some of the poetry, um, you can see the impact that service life has had on people, whether that be positive or not so great. Um, I think that that's really a powerful thing and our intent was always to have those stories there for for future for future generations um, because there will come a point where I suppose the, to look back in history and to not really understand maybe what what it took to get to a point where there's um, equity and equality across the board in in every aspect of service life um, and I think we thought that was really important to represent that in the you know in the voices of the people who wanted to tell those stories. Absolutely, and and I've I've read through the book, and I think the book is a it's a fantastic book because, like you said, what it does is you've got a real mix of memoirs, you've got the you've got the creativity as well, and you've got poems. And I think what what it does it flows on so you 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 read a memoir then you see it then you see a creative art piece then you see a poem it 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 works really well and you, you both should be very proud of what you've done so well done on on that it's a fantastic book and i i'd say it to all the listeners i get a copy of the book because you there's some amazing stories there's some amazing artworks and there's some amazing poems in that book so mel in the book you you ask the question what does it mean to be a female veteran would you consider that perhaps the first consideration for that question is to define women's reasons for serving and how they differ from those of men and that knowing why women choose to serve helps to understand how they process their service as a veteran differently to men afterwards? Um. So that the question at the end of the book, and I'm not sure how many people have have read that, was really about my personal struggle with some of, of being a female veteran and and what does that mean in a, in an Australian society context? Because, um, and that comes from a multiple sort of uh, things, and I I would hate to speak for everybody else, but I you know my, I think. Some of the reasons for joining could be very similar. I think sometimes the experiences that you have are interpreted differently um, depending on you know where you're serving, who you're serving with, and and a whole lot of other things. Um, for me, a lot of that questioning comes from um, the fact that you know I can stand next to my husband, who's also a, a, he's a Navy veteran, on Anzac Day and. It, it's just the micro reactions that you see, you know, people, you know, or the questions that you get asked about, you know, are you wearing your medals on the wrong side? Or, you know, are they your medals? He never gets asked those questions. He never gets um, looked at the, you know, in the, it's a, just a, it's just a different register, I suppose. And, um, you know, I was in a, in a lot of the things that I did, especially in the planning space, oftentimes I would be the only female in some of those planning environments that I was in. And it was, um, it never worried me at the time. It was not something that I, you know, other than walking to a room and just going, oh, okay, here I go again. Um, it wasn't until afterwards that I thought a bit about that and thought about how um, we don't see enough of or, you know, the female veterans use. And I really do think that 
you have to start seeing people to understand that you belong and vice versa and it then starts to feed on itself. So I, I think just generally I think, yeah, that the same reasons to join still stand, adventure, doing something different, wanting to be part of something bigger than just yourself um, is uh, probably still incredibly valid, valid reasons for everybody to join. Um, but I think particularly through, you know, Jen's um, service years and my early service years, you know, a lot of the leadership lectures that we'd get were, um, you know, all very male, very army focused type of things when that when you needed a breadth of leadership examples, um, you needed to start to see, especially as a young female officer, starts the power of seeing someone whether they're in the service or not in a leadership role is just uh, cannot cannot be underestimated um i think and so it comes from a lot of those that sounds very garbled what i've just said but i think it comes from just wanting to um you know que i've questioned that a lot and i think it's i think there are still a lot of ladies who do question that and i think you know some of that reticence to put your stories forward is feeling like your service is different or it's not as valued as perhaps other other people's service and i think and because you get questioned about your medals and and a few other things that it i think it's worth asking those questions what does it mean because um you know, in, in at some stage in the future, it those people won't have to deal with those sorts of questions, and that's that will be a good a good thing, I believe. Absolutely, and it's something that I touched on with Kelly Dads, and she was in she features in in your book, and she started the campaign by the left, mm. and it was a very successful campaign. And we, what you touched on with getting asked about your oh your medals are on the wrong side they should be on the right and and it's and she said it herself she said no mate i've actually served like i you know I, I these are my medals and it's i've seen it myself where i've i've seen female veterans say being told hey are they your, are they your brother's medals or are they and i can see where it would be uh, it would be confronting to be cuz no male is is that i'm aware of is asked Hey, you've got your medals on your wrong on the wrong side. So it was a really key point that Kelly touched on as well. That I for for us we it's we don't get we don't have to face that, and you guys do. And it, it's it's a shame that that is the the case. But it was a it was a key point that you touched on, and also Kelly touched on in her podcast earlier on in the year. And I think that's a it's a great question to to ask right at the end of the book. For both of you, when talking to other female veterans, when compiling this book, was was this question something that was discussed or were female veterans more focused on aspects of their service? We didn't, um, we didn't actually discuss the stories with the ladies. We just asked them to, to send them in. So um, it's, it's their stories, their words... And um, it was very much their their impression of of how the service affected them, good or bad. The the thing that, as I said before, that has really stuck with them. And um, I I don't think that they were really delving into the whys and wherefores. It uh, you know they were there to do a job, and um, that the the results that we saw in the book were their in, their impressions what was what was left over of uh, for them after after their service yeah and that's so varied yeah so f for both of you was there some stories that stood out more than others or was there more touching stories in in the book or was most of the stories very similar in in what the women experienced they're very different, and and some are definitely our favourites. Um, the ones that, no matter how many times we had reread them before the book was put together, I, I'd read it again now and and still tear up mm -hmm. because they're just uh, incredibly, incredibly emotional, and the emotional uh, the emotion of the um, of the ladies has has come through, 
And as I said, that that is clearly something that has really stuck with them. And um, I think that was what we were trying to aim for, and I think we were really successful in doing that. It was just showing a completely different side to the facts and figures that, that might come through in, uh, in a lot of other um, narratives about um, you know, a particular service or, or an event or, or something like that. Yeah, so we were trying to get right to the heart of, uh, of what the women felt. And I think you really did accomplish that. It, was, it is a very powerful book. It's, it's, and you're right, those sto- the emotion does come through on the pages with some of the... And it's not, just, it's, not just the, it's not just the memoirs, it's even some of the creative works as well and the, and, and the poems. There, it, that's where you see it, I think, more so than... than the, the memoirs, are, they are great as well, but it's the creative works and some of the poems that really you, you it really you do capture that emotion and and it was yeah absolutely Jennifer you're right you you touched on a key point the emotion does come through in that book so I think you I think you both did a fantastic job and and it was very well very well put together so well done I think what what we're not saying is that our male count, counterparts don't experience the same emotions um, as or we're, we're just focusing on on the females because we are female veterans and we wanted to get their stories out there. So we're not saying it's just an exclusive um, aspect of um, females in service. Of, of course the guys, you know, have, have the emotional responses to, to their service as well. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you have to sort of pick a lane to go into and that was the one that we, yeah. we yeah. decided to go into, yeah. I think too what it is thing you have to try and keep it in, in context as well and, and it's male veterans go through similar things but they don't face what women go through and, and I think that's the key point you touch on is you went down the avenue of, well, let's tell the women's stories. They need to be told, which... They hadn't been told before, so I think I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head. So, Mel, you you shared that when you were growing up, you had questions about what Anzac Day meant for you as a girl, and that you you wondered if you were less Australian because you didn't want to be someone's mate, or that I couldn't fight a war. Once the ADF removed restrictions for women serving in combat zones in 2011, have your ideas about mateship and fighting in a war changed in relation to your ideas when you were a little girl and also what it is to be an Australian? Um, so I'll just clarify on the mateship because I'll probably get hate mail or something. Or <laughs> um, I, I find personally that mateship is a very male male term and I know that it's used generically and I know women use it and, and all those sorts of things. But I always growing up, um, you know, especially in the 70s and 80s, you know, someone's mate was their male mates and men used the word mate and it wasn't really something that you know, you didn't necessarily grow up being as a, as a you know, um, little girl, you know, young girl and then woman. Um, and so that, that's just me. That's just, a, you know, something that I find, I've, I, you know, and when, especially when you associate that with um, a lot of the myth around the Anzacs and what they represent as, as Australians, um, I think that that is part of that, um, you know, it's just part of that that mythos, I suppose, um, and and what that means. So I'll just <laughs> and I'll just say that is my personal view, um, and I don't, you know, it, it, people feel differently. I, I'm not. That's not an argument. It's just a it's just a personal view that 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 I have. Um, yeah, and I suppose um, being a St- Australian, uh, that was, you know, I really struggled that with that even deploying. And being over overseas, and um, was I Australian enough? And by you know, I I don't have an extremely Oka accent. I you know, I don't look. Well, you can see me. People on the podcast obviously can't see me, but I'm not some. I'm not a chiselled bro- Aussie bronze person. I'm fair with lots of freckles, and you know, and you know, um, that that so. 
And when you have a very strong image of, of or an image that's been created of what it is to be, you know, an Anzac or be in that Anzac tradition and you don't meet that, that is the question that I pose to myself. Am I Australian enough? Um, am I, you know, is that, am I meeting that expectation or not? And, um, and, I, and I really struggled with that because, you know, not only was I... I was also Air Force, which again, Air Force and Navy seem to at times um, aren't as well known in the Australian context, I think, in terms of, you know, rank and a whole lot of other things. Um, so it was just a, it's a combination of all of those things. And I, I still don't know the answer to that. I don't, I don't know. I see some of the rhetoric, I see some of the comments that are made around and in, in particular, um, social media groups, and also in um, in public commentary of you know um, veterans, and I, I don't know. I don't know if I if I was ever Australian enough, or if if I am. I'd like to think I am. You know, I'm very um, very proud to be um, Australian. I I love the unique parts of our language, our vernacular, and all of those things. Um, but I, I don't know if I am Australian enough or not, and if my service and my, you know, my service to my country um, was enough as well. Do you know? Like I, I put my heart and soul into. I loved being in the Air Force. I loved being um, representative of my country and my service. And um, I'm still not sure. <laughs> Wow. Well, I think you you do shape up. Oh, so, good, good. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, and you I, do. I don't know if you feel that way, if you've ever felt that way or not. But that's something that you know I have felt very strongly and questioned quite a lot. Anyway, <laughs> what about yourself, Jennifer? What are you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, the whole the whole um, yeah sort of feeling if you're really part of it again because you know through through my era and I mean I only wore my service medal a couple of years ago for the very first time. Um, I had not marched in um, any of the Anzac parades outside of uh, when I was, I was still serving. Because, and, and this is a common comment from um, a lot of the, the ladies from my era, that because we didn't deploy, um, because we were very much um, in-country based, that, and, and the, the, the social view was um, Anzac Day was for some for, for those who had deployed overseas, fought in some sort of conflict, and because we hadn't, we really felt that um, we didn't deserve to a march and um, wear those medals, even though you know we earned them. And um, part of um, yeah Kelly's campaign uh, is by the left has has really made a lot of women from that um, period sort of think, well, yes, I am proud of my service um, and, yes, I'm going to get out there in March and I'm going to wear my medal and, and show people. And, uh, and it has been a, a, a really growing trend that a lot of the ladies are, are coming forward, and, um, which, is, which is lovely to see. And it's, it's very much a, a, a still a, a social um, view as to, you know, um, whose side the medal is on. And, and, and for a lot of the very young male um, guys that are serving ha or have served and are wearing their medals and they, they look as if they're only like 16 and um, yeah some of the yeah, they get questioned as well you know you're wearing your dad's medals on the wrong side and, and they say oh no I've earned these you know from, from their tours overseas so um, yeah so it's, it's, it's slowly changing and the, on the question of mateship I think women tend not to think in terms of mateship they tend to think in terms of um, shared experience, and I think that that is what uh, binds a lot of service women together, um, because we can. Um, it doesn't matter what era era you come from. Um, there is still it's still an achievement of having got through all of those um, parts of service that you have to get through. Each one is is an achievement. And um, I think it's, it's that shared experience. And I think women tend to talk more in terms of family, um, especially if they, uh, that I've heard the ladies deploy, they say, you know, uh, my family overseas, because they, they you know, sort of tend to hold it together and work together and support each other 
on those terms rather than um, you know using the term mateship. So it's um, probably very similar, but just slightly different. Yeah. <laughs> I think too what you touch on with when you said that you wore your medal for the first time a couple of years ago and decided to march again. I think it's something that's that's felt across the board as well that if males don't go and serve also like they do service but they don't go over they don't deploy overseas some of the men i've spoken to as well they don't wear their defense force medal on anzac day because they said well i'm i didn't deploy and i think it's across the board that it's you should be proud to wear your medal regardless of and I, I, there's a real stigma around to wear medals you have to deploy in and I feel that it's I don't feel it's right you you signed on the dotted line for service for your country that if you were called you could you would pay the old at some point you could pay the old you you signed a blank check with your life and I, I feel that every Australian who ever pulls on a uniform regardless whether they go overseas and serve or they just serve in a some especially Jennifer for you some of your roles, you, you weren't. Some roles just never get a chance to deploy. They, you know, and they're still a key point. Like they're, they're a key part of, like they're they're keeping the machine oiled while the troops are overseas. And I feel that some people get harshly criticised and not, and they feel that they don't belong, even though they they're part of they're a part of the defence force family. And I think that's I think that's right across the board. I don't feel that it's. I mean, what? How do you both feel about that? Do you? What? What are your opinions? Oh, absolutely. It's you know, it's a um, it's a team effort. Like everything that happens away needs to be supported by um, people back at back at home, whether that they be in the service or part of the national support base. I think it's potentially a sign. You know, we um, in modern, I'll say modern Australian history, while we did have some things happen in the Second World War on Australian territory, we haven't in modern history fought, you know, a uh, modern battle on our own soil. And maybe that changes that definition a little bit. Maybe it doesn't. I suppose it just it just depends. But I, yeah, I think... You know, and they, the definition of a veteran is um, by D, by the DVA definition is that someone who has served in the Australian Defence Force, whether that be for one day or for you know a thousand days or whatever that might be, and that's um, that's worth noting. And I think that's that's essential to understand because it's your willingness to be a part of right. that service and and potentially give your life, regardless of of what that might look like. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think we're trying to acknowledge when we do commemorate Anzac Day and Remembrance Day and and those significant yeah, days. Absolutely, it was a very key point to touch on as well, and and put it out to the broader defence community. And both of you, would you consider that one of the challenges for female veterans as they work out what it means to be a female veteran is that unlike unlike for men. They don't have centuries of military history or a unique Anzac legend to define their spirit. What What, what are your thoughts on that? I I think we the um, the stories are there. They just haven't been heard, and I think probably the last couple of years, as um, a lot of the stories have been dug out of the archives, and and we're seeing them come forward and 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 you read them and you think wow I didn't know that I didn't know that 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 woman did that and um, as I alluded to earlier the uh, the capability has always been there the women have always been there in all of those conflicts um, you know they may not be the one not always but sometimes holding the gun but they are certainly there doing some amazing um, amazing feats throughout the uh, throughout the campaigns and it's just a case of um, getting those stories out there so that um, our future young women in particular can say wow that is something to hold up and and say that we can be proud of and that we are capable of doing those things that it's not a purely male um, dominated um, institution that um, our women are certainly more than capable of, of doing some of these things and um, 
yeah, we just have to get those stories out there, get them told and get people to hear them is, is a thing. It's not that they haven't been done. Uh, you know, the, the, the events haven't occurred. They just haven't been heard. This is to both of you. It's only been 10 years since Australian women have been allowed to serve in combat zones. The beginning of our spirit lists major firsts for women in the military since 1964. Would you agree that female veterans are a new social group that society has previously had little to no experience with and that's one of the key challenges that female veterans face? Oh. Um, so I find that really interesting, right, because I, you know, in doing some research when we were, you know, when I was first thinking about the book and looking at what the law says and the fact that the Defence Force had um, some exceptions under the Equal Opportunity Act um, for, for those combat zones and those combat corps, I suppose. Um, you know, when I, and it, and it was in 2011, um, I find that really interesting because when I was in the Middle East, we were doing, we were, you know, um, acting as guards to, you know, to resupply drives and, and things like that. So I, I don't know how that worked or did not work, but whether or not the what the Act said and the full lifting of the, um, the exemptions from the Equal Opportunity Act, what, you know, whether or not they thought about that at the time but I think that's been happening throughout time but I think what happened when they actually did remove those last barriers where it did open up um, those last com combat roles to women so um, you know fighter aircraft fighter air crew um, you know some of the armoured corps in army and potentially oh I think navy are fairly integrated or there may have been I, I don't know enough about that to speak with any authority but I think by opening that up, you're then starting to you'll start to go back to that first. You're starting again from scratch in those particular areas where those exemptions were moved, and while there has been a general move forward and incorporation over many many years, and the numbers of women in the defence force are slowly slowly growing, um, you know the in those particular areas they're starting from scratch or they're starting you know they're they're growing in numbers and um and we'll start to get some of those stories as well as we move forward into the next decade and decades after that because they will be interesting stories and um to hear at, at some stage yeah so Our Spirit is a collection of stories and creative works from women who have served in the ADF since 1960. You, you state that other forms of recording that experiences of female veterans lacked vital elements of their spirit. What aspects of their spirit were you specifically referring to? Um, I, think it's just, I think it's just a, a, a wanting to be incorporated into that... Um, into the general understanding of what that Anzac spirit means, and um, you know, and and broadening that understanding from over history and over time as as that grows, and I think that's really what we're trying to say that you know the spirit that that what we consider Anzac spirit has grown over time and incorporates more and more people as more and more people. Um, have those experiences and I think that's really what we were trying to to get at is that um, most people who join the Defence Force in some way relate to that and share in that spirit that Anzac spirit and and it's you know it's growing um, depending on you know different groups that now get involved in, in the Defence Force through, you know, lifting of restrictions. And, and I think that's really what we were trying to say there. Mm. Yeah. Moving forward, how do both of you see the stories of female veterans? How do you see them being recorded? And, and is it the likes of more memoirs in books or is it doing podcasts? How would you like to see women's stories recorded in the future? Yeah, all all of the above, any any way possible, um, on on film, um, and um, documentaries, um, so people can actually see as as well as listen, 
and um, yeah, also their their artwork, the creative side of it. Um, there's there's a few military art programs that are that are happening at the moment, and um, people love looking at, at those, at seeing the the, the visual um, response. So any any way possible, um, I don't think that the um, you know the the book is ever actually going to go out, but um, any any form that people are willing to um, look at, listen to the stories, um, they need to be out there. I think, yeah. I think it's something that you touched on earlier, Jennifer. Was the stories need to be heard, mm. and in any way that we can do it, they need to be they need to be heard and and they need to be told. So. I've touched on this question before, but I, I want to bring it back. So the last question in the book asks if female veteran spirit is different from other male counterparts or is it the same? Mel, you have shared that you are still trying to work this out. Is this the same for you, Jennifer? Um, I, I don't... In, in one way, I, I do believe that our spirit is different purely for the... Uh, fact that we are female and we're not male and um, but the spirit for me is um, how we view a, a situation or, or our job or our, or our lives um, how we deal with it how capable we are of doing it and uh, our commitment to to the job and and that sort of thing and, and in a lot of those aspects no they're they're not different we're just as capable just as committed um, as as our male car- counterparts, but I don't think that we can rule out um, that the female point of view in any situation may be slightly different. We may see something um, differently, uh, be able to come up with a, a, a different way of doing things. And I think if you take that out of the equation, you're missing 50% of the capability of whatever it is that you are trying to achieve. And uh, so it's important to have that that viewpoint and uh, which is part of um, the the female spirit um, having all of those aspects in there to get the full story and to to get a rounded uh, point of view of of something so um, in in some ways yes it's different and it should not be discounted because it is the female spirit that is is bringing that to the to the table so yeah so just Lastly, to to finish up, if people would like to get a copy of of Our Spirit, how do they get in touch with both of you to get a copy of the book? Well, um, so they can either email us directly at ourspiritcollection at hotmail.com or we um, and and we can put them in touch with how to best get copies of, of the book. Yeah, so we've got and we're hoping to um, have an electronic copy as well as how copy available very soon. Just to finish up, what projects are you both working on currently and into the future? Um, yeah, working on a, on, a, on a project like this, and because and the book only came out last year, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty full on. And um, sometimes we um, try and sort of you know, turn our focus more inward and, and do some of our own... or me in particular, some of um, my own writing and, and creative aspects, always in the back of our minds, we always thought that we would do a, a, a follow-up um, set of stories because we don't think that the stories, um, there are still stories to be told. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for you, Mel, what have you got coming up in? Um, um, so I'm actually writing a middle grade novel at the moment um, and I've just about finished the second draft of, of that. I also just recently, um, well, last year I did um, editor training and I've just started my own um, structural editing business as well, um, which, yeah, is very exciting. So I, I really will see in future years sitting more within that writing space and that, that creative space. But like Jen said, you know, we it's a lot of effort to go and... and put something a book together and do all that all that work and um it's nice just to spend time do, doing some um you know of my own writing and my, and um and growing my own business but also our view was that we hoped that when people could see the respect 
that we have given to their stories and the the um, the quality of the product that we've managed to pull together that the next time if we go and do a next one that we will get more and we and people will be more confident of actually seeing how well the stories have been received through podcasts and other things but also trust us with with their stories um, be, and, and to produce something that is that they can be proud of and and show others um, I think that's really what what we're hoping in the future so. and it was what you just touched on i caught up with rach ranton who is one of the people in that features in your book yesterday and we we did a podcast about her service and her life after service and it was a thing that she said in the podcast that it resonated like you said just then it's sticking the head above the parapet and and i know it's a it's it's a ironic thing to say but it's the these women who've stuck their head above the parapet are brave they they've they're coming forward telling their stories and it was just something that Rach said to me that really resonated and I when you just said that it was it was yeah these women their stories are fantastic they they're a real credit to both Jennifer and yourself Mel that you you've taken the time you've selected these stories and there this is only just the start of many more great stories to come and and i think you have done a fantastic job with this book and you both should be very very proud of what you've done and and all i can say is thank you both for your service thank you both for coming on true blue history and and just talking about uh, a really important topic and i i'm really grateful that you both came on true blue history so thank you both for coming on not a problem thank you thank you very much Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. And if you feel like supporting us, you can now via our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash true blue history or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash true blue history and check out our new website truebluehistory.com for more great content.